Good morning, church. Good morning. It's a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord today. And this morning, we return once again to the book of Revelation, chapter 6. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open your Bible, find Revelation 6. And the last time that we were in this chapter, two weeks ago, we had looked at the entire chapter 6. We looked at it as a whole, and we looked at it through the lens of the post-millennial worldview, which saw that the breaking of the first six seals all took place in and around A.D. 70, leading up to A.D. 70, and the conquest and fall of Jerusalem by the Romans. Now, Christian believers, if you remember, Christian believers were the only ones who were spared. They were the only ones who survived the deadly onslaught of Rome because they actually heeded Christ's warning uh, back in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. But once Rome uh, had overtaken Jerusalem, remember they killed everybody inside its walls. Either they killed them or they took them as slaves to be sold into foreign countries and different parts of the world. Uh, and then they destroyed the temple. They stripped it of all of its gold. And then after that, Rome ceased their attack. They stopped there. And that spared the Christians who then had fled to the mountains and to neighboring cities. Just like Jesus said, he said, if the days had not been cut short, nobody would have survived. But the Lord cut it short. Once they had sacked the city, took away people, killed people, and destroyed the temple, Rome stopped. They did not continue to move ahead. But as each of the first six seals were broken, God was unleashing his wrath against those who had rejected him. The Jewish people had rejected him. And we just saw it through our Sunday school lesson. They did it over and over and over again, falling into idolatry, worshiping idols and foreign gods. Not only did they reject the one true God, but then they actually murdered their Messiah. They killed Jesus. And uh, they persecuted the church. They were constantly persecuting. You remember all the things that Paul did when he was Saul of Tarsus before he started using his Greek name of Paul. He had persecuted the church, and it was this great persecution. So God was, he was breaking out his wrath, and he actually, he used pagan Rome as a tool for his vengeance against the Jews. And you know, an atheist one time asked Ken Ham. Ken Ham is the uh, founder of Answers in Genesis Ministries, and in a debate, an atheist asked him, says, well, Ken, why doesn't your God come down to earth and show himself to people? And Ken looked at him and said, well, he did. And they killed him. Jeremiah was right when he proclaimed that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what he said about the human heart. You know, the world today says, just follow your heart. Trust your heart. But the Bible says, don't do that. Your heart is deceitful. It will lead you into all sorts of wicked and deceitful things. Uh, and how true that is. How true it is that the unregenerate heart of man is corrupt, is deceitful, and is desperately wicked. Which is why when we're born again, we're actually given a heart transplant. We are, we are given a, a, a new heart. The old, sinful, stony heart is removed and God gives us a heart of flesh. A heart, that, a heart like God's own heart. It's one that, that loves God and desires holiness. And again, this morning we're going to be looking back at Revelation 6 and we're going to, we're going to take off the post-millennial glasses and we're going to put on the premillennial worldview. Premillennial. And that's where we move away from John's looking at it as a near prophecy, Rome coming in and destroying Jerusalem and God taking his, his revenge and his, his wrath against the Jewish people at that time. And we're going to interpret it in the view of coming events, future events. In other words, if you go to a movie and you see the previews, coming soon. Well, this is what's going to be coming soon to a world near us. And so, again, with that, we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 6. Is everybody at uh, Revelation 6? Everybody there? Amen? Amen. All right, so let's look at Revelation 6, starting at verse number 1. John writes, he says, Now when I saw the Lamb, this is Jesus, when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, in writing to the church in Thessalonica, in, in, in Paul's letter, he wrote these words, prophesied of the end times, and Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He said, but concerning the times... And the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. In other words, it's going to come when you don't, you're not expecting it. 
For when they say, this is an important part that ties into what we're looking at today. Paul writes, for when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now Paul writes, when you hear peace and safety, you hear the world and the news and people saying peace and safety, stay alert for sudden destruction will come. Now, as we look at, at the Scripture portion for today, that's exactly what we're seeing when this first seal is open. We're seeing peace. Peace, man. We're seeing world peace. But this is a false peace. It's not a real peace. It's a very temporary peace. And notice here, notice in verse 2 of chapter 6, John describes the horseman as sitting on what? He's sitting on a, on a white horse. Now, Whenever the people back in John's day, when they would have read that, they would have easily understood what that would mean. You see, Roman generals, Roman generals who celebrated victory, they would come riding into a parade on a white horse or in riding on a chariot being pulled by multiple white horses. And so that's what we're seeing. This is some kind of ruler that's coming in. He's a conquering ruler. He's on a white horse. And what does he have? What does it say that he has? He's, he, he sat on it, had a what? Had a, had a bow. Now, notice though what the bow does not have. What does it not have? What does a bow need to be deadly? Arrows. It needs arrows. That's exactly right. It needs arrows. So this rider has a bow, but he has no arrows to go with the bow. So in other words, this rider, these arrows, he has no arrows, and that signifies that he conquers without war. He's going to be a conqueror, but he's going to do it without bloodshed. He's going to do it without war. Now, he's going to have power. He's going to have a military-type power and strength, but he doesn't use it to conquer. So he has the bow. So again, the bow signifies his might, but he doesn't use physical force. He's not using physical force, not outright at least, to accomplish his mission. But what's his mission? Well, verse 2 tells us. He went out conquering and to conquer. So that's his mission. He's on a white horse. We have to ask the question, is he successful in this mission? Yes, he is successful. Because we read that he's given what? He's given a, a stephanos in the Greek. It's a victor's crown. It's that laurel wreath that goes around the, horn, uh, the head of someone who has conquered, someone who has won. So he's given a crown. So we know he is successful in this mission of world peace, of conquering the world. But... How do we interpret this then with a premillennial worldview? Well, the first scroll, yeah, again, it pictures a world leader. He's coming onto the scene, and, and he comes offering a false hope and a false promise of world peace, of, of uniting the world together as, as one. The world actually joins together. They, they join hand in hand, and they give him what he wants. They give him world power, world control. But then that begs the question, well, why should we interpret it this way? I mean, we looked at it at the post-millennial view last time. So why should we interpret these verses as, as being some kind of world peace that's coming? Well, I'm going to give you two reasons. Here's the first reason. Look at verse number 4 of chapter 6. Look at verse 4. Look what it says. And another horse, fiery and red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him... A great sword. And so when the, when, when the second seal is broken and the second horseman, he's loosed and he's able to go out into the world on this fiery red horse, what does he do? He takes peace from the earth. And so by logical deductive reasoning, we have to say, well, if he's taken away peace from the earth, there had to have been what? There had to have been peace in order for peace to be taken away. You can't take peace away if it's not there. And since he's given this ability to take peace from the earth, there must have been peace on the earth. That's the first one, deductive reasoning. There was world peace. Here's the second one. The prophet Daniel actually speaks of this man in Daniel chapter 9. Hold your place here in Revelation 6. Let's go back to Daniel's prophecy. Now, we spent a long time in the book of Daniel, and we went back through that. You can go back and read, uh, watch the series on YouTube. But Daniel chapter 9. I'll give you just a moment to get there, and when you're there... We'll be looking at verses 26 to 27 of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Amen. Amen. Daniel had a lot of prophecy for us and spoke a lot about the coming Antichrist, the end times. 
Right, so Daniel chapter 9, starting at verse number 26. Look what Daniel writes. Now, he's, this is prophesying. He's seeing the future. After the 62 weeks, now remember, weeks, uh, a day is a year, and so a week is seven years. Seven days, seven years. 62 weeks, that equals out to 434 years. After that, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So that was prophesying Jesus to come and being crucified. He's being cut off. And then the people of the prince who is to come. When Daniel writes that, now he's looking way into the future. The prince who is to come, this is the Antichrist. And he shall destroy the city. He shall destroy the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood till the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Again, you can look at that as Rome destroying Jerusalem and, 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 and the temple, but also the Antichrist and things that he's going to do. But then look at verse 27. Then he, speaking of the Antichrist, the prince who is to come, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And again, one week is each day, represented of a year. This is a seven-year peace treaty. It's a covenant for seven years. But, look what happens. In the middle of the week, three and a half years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering on the wing of abomination, shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out of the desolate. So again, if you remember back to our study in Daniel, we saw that this prince who is to come, this is the coming Antichrist. He and the covenant and he makes he's going to bring about a false world peace. The world will be united. There will actually be world peace. There will be no war. There will be no conflict. There will be this this peace that settles upon the earth, but it's going to be temporary for three and a half years. But Daniel chapter 11, we won't look at it today, but Daniel chapter 11 reveals that there's going to be a rebellion. That the kingdoms from the north and the south are going to come against them, uh, come against this man and, 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 his, and his powers and he's going to lash out with his military might. He's going to completely crush this rebellion. And then he's going to become so emboldened by this where he just easily destroys and puts down rebellion. He'll become so emboldened with his power that he actually, the scripture says, that he will stroll into the temple, he will set himself down and proclaim that he is God. And that's literally when all hell breaks loose upon the earth at this point. He'll desecrate the temple, which then again is going to lead to a horrific wave of brutal oppression and persecution, the like that has never been seen before. Now let's turn back to Revelation chapter 6. Let's go back to Revelation 6. So we have to ask then, okay, well, what then would lead to world peace? What's going to lead, lead to world peace and, and the emergence of the Antichrist? What's going to kick this off, the, this rider on the white horse? There has to be some cataclysmic worldwide event that leaves the entire world in fear and panic. Something has to happen. Something <coughs> big has to happen, in other words, to enjoin the entire world together, to unify together. Because right now, the world is not unified together. So something has to happen that is going to bring the entire world together. And something has to happen to pave the way for this world leader. Got to be something big. It's got to be something that touches every nation. It touches every nation and every single people group around the world, where everybody completely unites and agrees. What could it be? Well, there's some possibilities. Some say, I've even heard some people say, even in Christian circles, maybe it's an alien invasion. People all the time talking about seeing UFOs and UFBs and all these things. Maybe it's an alien invasion. You know, with the rise of AI and holographic imaging, it would be easy to fake something like that. But it could be an alien evasion. Maybe it could be some cataclysmic event. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's a cataclysmic event. Maybe it could be an asteroid hitting the earth. You know, Scripture talks about stars falling from the skies. Maybe an asteroid's going to hit. You see it all the time. They talk about these asteroids that are coming near, coming near the earth. It's going to come near the earth. It's going to be really close. What if one hit the world? Maybe uh, it could be the Yellowstone National Park mega volcano could erupt shifts the axis of the planet, they said. It would be such a cataclysmic eruption that it actually would shift the axis of the planet. It would kill thousands, if not millions of people. It would actually plunge the world into darkness and all these plumes of molten ash going up in, into the sky. It would blanket out the sky. It would make the sun uh, blotted out, basically. It would make the moon appear as blood. So that's a possibility. Some natural disaster. How about another theory? What about the rapture of the church? Yes. 
Now there is, again, there's so much debate. Is there going to be a rapture? Is there not a rapture? You know, the scripture is supported. Is it not? We looked at that back earlier in the scriptures. But can you imagine, though, just imagine for just a moment, if in a blink of an eye, suddenly millions of people just vanished from the world. Just vanished. The Holy Spirit leaves the world. Could you imagine? Can you imagine the, 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 with all the panic and confusion and fear, and you know, you've probably seen movies and read books, airplanes dropping out of the sky, but all of a sudden the pilot's gone. He just vanishes. He's out of there. And there's mass chaos around the world. There's fear. That kind of environment would be a perfect time for somebody to step forward as the voice of calm and reason. It's actually been suggested again with the rise of AI and, and holographic imaging. They, they, they would say that it's some kind of alien invasion that came down and either kidnapped people or destroyed missing people. It'd be an easy way to say, oh, you know, that's what it was. It was aliens. And, but then this leader comes up and says, but we conquered them and we, we got rid of them. So we should all just now unite together. We got rid of all those pesky Christians are now gone. And again, thanks to this world leader, he and his forces were able to thwart the invasion. Saving the world. And then out of this chaos, the world unites and names this man the de facto leader of the world. The new world. Well, that is one theory. But you know, it could also be the world economic system just collapses. That wouldn't be a big surprise. It could be wars erupt all over the planet and in desperation there's no economy anymore. All these wars that are going on, everything's ravaging. In desperation, and in, in this... This desperation for a return to peace and, and normalcy. I just want things to be peaceful and normal. Then people will just exchange their freedom for a sense of peace. That's not far-fetched at all, is it? They willingly hand over world power to this great uniter. I just want things to go back to normal. I just want to be peaceful again. I just want to go back into my, my home and just enjoy my life like it is. I don't want the boat to be rocked. So, yes, you take control. I mean, who don't want world peace, right? People have been talking about world peace for a long, long time, for years. They've been talking about one world government. Especially the power-hungry elites. They want a one world government. And believe it or not, there's actually, if you do a little bit of re just a little bit of research, there's actually... There's actually a, a group of power elites who actually have a plan in motion right now for this one world government. Did you know they even have a flag for it? I'll show you what it looks like. This is the one world, this is the official one world government flag. This is what it looks like. You can find it at metroflags.com. Just put on there one world flag. And this is what it looks like. Now, the, and they tell you what each of these things represent. I'm going to read them out for you. This is according to their own website. Green represents the earth, humanity, human progress and unity, agriculture and life. The blue represents the United Nations. It represents hope, water, the atmosphere which allows us to breathe, and the sky which allows us to travel, to seek, and to explore. The black represents the darkness of space. It also represents the hardships that humanity will overcome and the last frontier of human exploration and the settlement of the solar system and beyond. And then lastly, you see 13 stars. That represents the world broken up into 13 regions all under the authority of a one world government. North America, South America, the Caribbean Atlantic region, Europe, Eurasia and Central Asia, Africa, Eastern Asia, Australia, Pacific Oceania, Southern Asia, the Middle East, and in the maritime regions. They already have the world broken up. And they'll have 13 leaders ruling in each of those sections. There's plans in motion. So these shadowy, power-hungry elites, they've got a plan. They've even got a flag now. They've even got a flag. But then what's their goals? What are the goals in that? Well, Dr. MacArthur actually lists seven goals that they have. And these are the goals. So if you're a note taker, first goal for a one world government is what's called equity. Equality is a thing of the past. They don't want equality. They want equity. They want to redistribute all wealth, all assets, and all possessions equally across the planet to everybody. No one will be permitted to have more than anybody else. doesn't matter how hard you work or not how hard you work. Everybody will have equal stuff. 
except, of course, for the ruling class. They'll have more, and they'll have more money and more power. Think communism on steroids. So they want equity. Second thing they want is currency. They want control of money. They want a single global currency and preferably digital currency. Because that'll be convenient, right? You don't have to carry cash on you. You just have a card. You, you just do this. You have a chip, whatever. But they want a digital currency. That way they can control all finances and all spending. They will control what you buy, when you buy, how much you buy, and where you buy. They talked about the 15-minute cities they're trying to build. You may have heard that in the news. They say it'll be a good thing. It'll help cut down on climate change. But the way that'll work is you have a 15-minute, a they know how far you can travel 15 minutes from your home. Everything that you'll need, they'll say, will be within that 15 minutes. And if you go past the 15 minutes, your car will no longer work. You can't buy or sell outside of that 15 minutes. That's part of that. So they want control, they want equity, they want control of the currency so they can control where you go, what you buy, where you buy. You want to buy a gun and bullets? No, 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 no. That is against the government. Your car will not work. Your money will not work there. Number three, the environment. They want equal worldwide commitment from every single human being to their radical climate and environmental agenda. And everybody will be forced to get on board. They want control of that. One thing they don't tell you, but they're, now they say there's so much carbon dioxide in the air, is that now, for some reason, the trees are, are growing bigger and stronger. There's more trees and more plants. It's because it's what they use as carbon dioxide. And then what do trees give? Oxygen. So the more trees, the more oxygen we have. I digress. The fourth thing they want, taxation. They want worldwide taxation, and nobody gets out of being taxed. That way, all the world lines their pockets and funds their agenda. Number five, immigration. They want open borders. They don't want borders at all. They want you to be able to freely travel because they buy into the humanistic lie that people are just basically good at heart. And all the people that are streaming across the border, well, they just want the best for America and the best for you and your home. Number six, crisis response. And this is a big one. They want every nation, every person under control of the World Health Organization. That way, everybody has to obey their orders for how they feel everybody has to behave. Many believe, as I do, that 2020 and COVID, that was a dry run. Mm -hmm. It was a dry run. I mean, it was real, it was legitimate, but that was a dry run to see how fearful and how subservient people would be. Lock down your business. Don't travel. Don't do this. And people willingly complied. And sadly, the results were just what they wanted. <clears throat> and it's again, it's thanks to the propaganda and the media manipulation along with the demonizing of dissenting and opposing viewpoints. You could lose your job if you gave uh, a dissenting or opposing viewpoint. You'd be locked out of your social media. The last part, the seventh one, is war. Do they want war? No, they don't want war. They, they, but they truly believe that if they can accomplish those first six goals, if they can, if they can create equity and, and control the currency, control the environment, control taxation and immigration and crisis response, they believe that if they can successfully erase all nations, erase all individuality and individual freedoms, and they can conform the world into a new one world order through this unity, wars will cease to exist. Because they'll control everything. They truly believe this satanic lie. Now, why do I say it's a satanic lie? I say that because it's all secular, humanistic pipe dream, and it's straight from the, from the pit of hell. Humans, as I read earlier, it's what Jeremiah said, the human heart is desperately wicked and evil, and it wants what it wants. And if you have sinful people doing that, and you have sinful people being told you're nothing but rearranged pond scum, that you're, you're just an animal that's evolved, then we shouldn't be surprised when people act like animals, and they will. And that's why they hate America so much. That's why they have to see America completely destroyed. They don't like our sovereign freedoms we say are given to us by God and not by people. They don't like that. They don't like our nationality. They don't like the American First Movement. No, no, no. We have to be united as a world. And church, that's not new. That's not a new philosophy. 
Every megalomaniacal world leader, from Nebuchadnezzar to Alexander to Napoleon to Hitler, they all wanted the same thing, and that's world domination. And actually, it extends back further than that. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 11. After the flood, the people who began to repopulate the earth, remember, they were still given the same mandate as Adam and Eve, go out into all the world, spread out, subdue the world, enjoy the world that I've given you. They were given that mandate to multiply, be fruitful. But what did the people do? Did they obey God? No. They all gathered together. Uh, turn over to Genesis chapter 11. I want us just to look at this real quick. Because again, this, it's just a replay from back then as to what it is today. As Rebecca and I talked about earlier, there's nothing new under the sun. It all just history repeats. So Genesis chapter 11. Amen when you're there. First book, chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Amen. Look what Moses writes. The whole earth had one language. It had one speech. What the new world order wants us to go back to. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks. Bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone. They had asked for it for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves that we lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. In other words, are saying, we don't want to be spread out. We want to be together. We want to be united as one. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the Son of Men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Resist as they may, God still, his will is sovereign. Now, who was the leader, though? Who was leading this rebellion? Well, chapter 10 tells us. Just look back one chapter. Look at verses 6 to 10. So Genesis 10, starting at verse 6, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sapta, Rama, Saptaka, and the sons of Rama were Sheba and Adam. Verse 8, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. Babel. He's the one that started Babel. He was this evil leader. Nimrod, the mighty hunter, which by the way, in Hebrew, the word for hunter is Sahid, and that means killer. It doesn't necessarily mean hunter, it means killer. He didn't hunt and just kill animals, but he hunted and killed all who would oppose him and his rule, and the coming Antichrist Lord order is going to hunt and kill all who oppose them. It's just a replay. That's all it is. People in Nimrod's day, just like the ungodly today, they want one world. They want one people group. They want one leader. They want to be free of individuality. They want to be free of personal freedoms. They, they, and in all of this, this is a rebellion against our Creator who commanded humanity, again, to be fruitful and multiply, to go out, to subdue the earth. And what we're actually seeing is a fulfillment of Psalm number 2. It's a fulfillment of Psalm 2. So, Last one for today. Turn over to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. Let's go, if you're in Genesis now, go forward till you find Job, and then you come to the book of Psalms. And we're going to look and see how God, I mean, even though humanity and the forces of Satan, they, they laugh right now, they, they mock and rebel today, God is still in control. And look at how God responds to feeble humanity's attempt to rebel. So Psalm 2, amen, if you're there. Amen. Look what, look what the psalmist writes. Why do the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh the Lord, against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Doesn't that sound like the world today? They want to get rid of God. They want to get rid of Christianity. He who sits in the heavens, though, what does he do? He laughs. The Lord shall hold them in derision and confusion. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and, he, and distress them in his deep displeasure. 
Yet I have sent my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Yahweh has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This is the father speaking to the son. Ask of me, I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord, worship the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Sinful, rebellious humanity, they may think that they're in charge. They may think that they're captains of their own destiny. But in reality, God sits in heaven and he laughs at their feeble attempts to overthrow his will. Verse 13 commands us to kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way. That means to humble yourself, submit yourself to Him in His perfect, unstoppable will. You see, the thing that people don't understand is that all of humanity, every man, woman, and child, already stands guilty before our holy God. We're already guilty. Our default destination is judgment and hell. That's the default destination. It's not... We, we grow older and then we sin and then that's our default. We're born and that's our default. Is hell and judgment. But God is rich in mercy and today He offers grace to any and all who will kiss the Son, who will bow their knee to Him and His will. Man's resistance to God is futile. Here's the equivalent if you want to resist God. Imagine you're standing on a beach. This is a smaller scale. But imagine you're standing on the edge of the beach on the edge of the ocean and you see a 10,000 foot or 10,000 mile high tidal wave and you stand there and you go, stop. <laughs> How futile is that going to be? 10,000 mile tidal wave. But that's what it's like when people try to rebel against God. It's futility in church. Either you will bow your knee to Him willingly and surrender to Him in amazing grace or on the day of judgment, He's going to break your knees and you're going to bow before Him in judgment and wrath. So what we're seeing here in this first two verses of Revelation 6 is a false peace, a false unity, just like at the Tower of Babel. And the only thing it does is provoke God's judgment. That's all it does. And again, here in Revelation 6, the breaking of the first seal, God allows those who reject Him to experience a temporary false peace. But what they don't know is that this is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. This is the beginning of the God's divine judgment. They're going to get their heart's desire. They will get world unity and world peace. But at what cost? It's that old saying, be careful what you ask for. They'll soon be enslaved to the evil atrocities of the Antichrist. They're going to be enslaved to him and his vile and twisted desires. They will, e they will either be ruled by a holy, good, and just God, or they're going to be ruled by Satan and his wicked and perverse forces. So then, to close, what's our takeaway from today? Our takeaway is this, rebellion to God and his word will always result in judgment. Always. I'll read that again. Rebellion to God and His Word will always result in judgment. Church, verses 10 to 12 in Psalm 2. Now therefore be wise. Be wise. O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest He be angry and you perish in the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. And then here's the glorious promise. Blessed are all those who put their trust in Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. As we take this look into the future, Lord, we don't know. This could be decades from now. It could be 100 years from now. But Lord, this could be today as well. We don't know. But we do know, Lord, that in all things, You are our mighty fortress. You are our refuge that we can flee to. And Lord, you offer that refuge today to anybody, to anyone. doesn't matter where you were born, what language you speak, whatever socioeconomic background you come from. To any and all who repent and trust in you today, Lord, you offer them grace and mercy. Lord, help us to be true and faithful servants that we can go out and warn people of the judgment to come, of the wrath to come, and that today they need to flee to you. And just as Noah did, Lord, just as Noah did... Seven days before you closed the door of the ark, he stood at the edge of the ark. The Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness and he called out to family and friends and neighbors to come. There's plenty of room. Escape judgment. But they laughed and they mocked as he called and called. And then on that seventh day, you shut the door to the ark. You shut that. And judgment came. 
Lord, help us to have a heart for loved ones, for our neighbors, friends, strangers, Lord, for everyone around us, that we may proclaim the gospel to them, that they may seek you today as their refuge and their fortress and safety. And we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you are doing and for what you're going to do. And Lord, we ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, we sing.